Welcome to the Power of Lived Experience in Research and Evaluation, the Child Welfare Edition. My name is Gina Brown, a family consultant with the Capacity Building Center for States. We hope you're enjoying the 2022 Child Welfare Virtual Expo, and we're glad that you're here. Our goal today is to provide resources and tools on how to sustain positive partnership with young adults and families with lived experience by providing various collaboration strategies for both research and data evaluation. We appreciate our speakers, and it's my pleasure to introduce them. First, we will hear from Mr. Brian Samuels, coming to us from Chapin Hall. Then we will hear from Dr. Alex Wagman of Virginia Commonwealth University, Department of Social Work. Joining Dr. Wagman will be Tiffany Haynes, a Division X consultant with ICF. Mr. Samuel, the room is yours. <music> I've been in child welfare for more than two decades. And today there's been um, exciting change. Um, there's been more creativity and innovation in the field than um, certainly as long as I've been a part of uh, the system. Real change is happening both at the state, the local, uh, and at the federal level. Systems leaders are really committed to improving the lives of the most vulnerable families in this country. Uh, as a former child welfare director, I used administrative data uh, to drive all of my day-to-day -day decisions. However, administrative data doesn't always tell the complete story. So child welfare systems often use research to supplement um, what they can learn uh, from their administrative data. Qualitative data in particular is valuable for capturing, capturing the lived experiences of people involved in the system. Public systems have come to recognize that young people and their families can make important contributions to reforming the system. Increasingly, the child welfare system, the runaway and homeless youth system, even the juvenile justice system, is using research methods to engage partners, engage people with lived experience to really change and revitalize um, the day-to-day -day operations of those systems. One example of work that we did to contribute from a research perspective to a, a system trying to make change is something called the Voices of Youth Count Project. In that project, uh, we began uh, um, with a simple premise that we wanted to be able to understand the stories of young people experiencing homelessness. Uh, because of that basic orientation towards understanding their story, each of our interviews began with a simple question. If you think of your experience in housing instability as a story, tell us where your story begins. Through that beginning, through that level of engagement, um, we used um, a variety of methods um, of collecting information from young people through these interviews. The study itself had um, actually three different components. Um, it involved six different locations. Uh, it also uh, involved engaging research teams from each of the locations. So we invited, recruited, uh, and supported local research teams that included interviewers and transcribers. Uh, we brought them all together in one place uh, to train them uh, uh, in a two-day intensive session. And then we brought them back again uh, in the middle of their data collection to make sure that we were all on the same page debrief, pull apart, put back together again, and then send them back out to finish, finish their work. Um, through that uh, uh, elaborate arrangement, uh, we were able to capture um, a narrative uh, that describes uh, um, their story. We were able to capture a timeline that talked about the variety of housing situations they had experienced. Uh, and we also did a background survey so that we had some basic demographic information from which we could then enrich and describe the experiences, not just of the large population, but also the subgroups that might sit underneath that. Uh, we used a variety of recruitment strategies um, because we really wanted a diverse group um, of young people uh, involved uh, in the study. Uh, and then most importantly, 
uh, when it came to data analysis and meaning making, um, we took all of that data back to those local sites, engaged those young people that had been a part of the study itself or who had been a part of the field teams collecting and, and trans transcribing the data. We brought them back together to help us make meaning of the data. So we did that in each of the sites. Um, uh, and through that analysis and meaning making process, uh, we learned a whole bunch of things uh, um, uh, through the experience, right? So we learned youth logics and how they engage services. They describe the decision making that went into uh, um, the process of choosing one service or another or when to engage. We also learned a lot about their trajectory of homeland housing instability, meaning that it wasn't just a single event, but it was multiple events that moved together that ultimately led to some kind of critical condition um, that produced the particular circumstance um, that they were in. Um, and then finally, we did uh, um, some policy analysis. We took their stories and the meaning making that emerged from those studies and we those stories and we applied them to um, a, piece, a piece of federal legislation, uh, the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act. Uh, and the purpose there was to clearly demonstrate the relationship between what young people said and what the legislation was designed to do. And so in the end, we were able to bring that back to these communities and to these young people and give them a chance to see how their voice really could be leveraged and elevated for the purposes of changing public policy. Hi, I'm Alex. And I'm Tiffany. And um, as you've heard, we're going to talk with you a little bit today about participatory action research. Um, a form of research that is used often to engage folks with lived experience in research and evaluation work. And we're going to highlight some things, some lessons learned um, that we've had over the last years in our experience using participatory action research in ways that you might be able to take those learnings and engage folks with lived experience in your own research and evaluation. So just to give you a really quick introduction to what participatory action research is so that you kind of know what we're talking about and what we've done. Um, participatory action research is actually rooted in the belief that the people who live most closely or most proximate to the issues that are being researched are actually the true experts in the issue and that they should in fact be in the position of being a researcher. And in a lot of ways, this might sound like obvious, um, but it is not how traditionally how research is done and it's not typically how researchers are trained. Researchers tend to be people who are distant from the topic um, or even intentionally trained to try to be distant or objective um, from the topic that they're doing research on, which can really impact how the research is designed, how it's conducted, how the research data is analyzed and then how it's disseminated and used to enact change. Another key thing about participatory action research that's important to understand is that people with lived experience expertise, uh, which is a phrase we've come to, to use in our work, um, are really seen as um, being essential to every single component of the research process. And this is also a little bit different from other forms of community-based research where people might be um, asked to advise on research design, but then aren't participating in conducting the research, or maybe they're asked to comment on the findings at the end, but they weren't part of designing or implementing the research. Participatory action research asks um, folks with lived experience to engage in all components of the research. And then the third kind of big piece that's really important to understand about participatory action research is that it is research that's intended to create change. So it's not just research for knowledge's sake. Um, it's really going in with a, a plan in mind around an issue that needs to be addressed and where change, particularly change related to equity and justice, um, needs to be understood and solutions need to be identified and enacted. So those are some really important aspects of participatory action research. 
And as you probably hear in me talking, it's really rooted in some core values and some core beliefs. Um, and it's rooted in critical theory, which we won't go into today, but critical theory really says that particularly when you're trying to understand systems um, and institutions such as the child welfare system, um, that you have to think about systems as being having been built. Um, they've been constructed over time. And what that means is they can also be changed and deconstructed if needed. And so that is really part of this belief in participatory action research, that research can result in action, which can result in change. We believe, and this is why we're talking to you about it today, we believe that participatory action research is an effective method to prioritize and advance equitable child welfare practice and policy. And we, the way we approach participatory action research, people do it in lots of different ways, the way that we do it is really by um, centering and building a team among folks who are most directly affected by the issue that's being researched. In our case, it's youth homelessness. In your case, it might be child welfare. Um, and we build those spaces and protect those spaces while there might be other stakeholders who are impacted by the issues. We really center and protect the spaces of those with lived experience expertise. Um, as researchers in participatory action research. Um, and that's really essential for power building. So again, not just about developing knowledge, but also about um, deciding what solutions and what kind of actions should be taken and engaging those researchers with lived experience also in that action, which engages folks in building and, and accessing their power and finding their power and being part of the kind of solutions that we think are truly uh, the most meaningful. So I'm gonna turn it over to Tiffany, who's gonna talk a little bit more about what that process looks like and a key component of participatory action research. Thank you, Alex, that was a great introduction. Um, so now I'm gonna go into the role of critical consciousness in participatory action research. So critical consciousness is really um, helping to build an individual's capacity to understand how um, their lived day-to-day uh, -day experience connects to bigger systemic um, historical uh, systemic um, issues um, that also plays a role in how they are able to navigate the world today. Um, so being able to make those connections also helps with empowering and building their knowledge base so that they can feel empowered to do that change work. So critical consciousness is an essential piece to um, helping um, young people or individuals with lived expertise engage in the work in a meaningful and authentic way. Um, one of the pieces that I would like to lift up is the importance of acknowledging that the harm that systems have caused historically um, uh, caused to young people and their families and to not really shy away from that. Um, this is a moment where that will need to be embraced. Um, and it is also an essential piece of uh, trust building um, and engaging in that healing centered um, in healing centered practices um, throughout the um, engagement and beyond. Um, uh, another thing that um, you would need to consider is what are the implications um, when uh, people are working, when you're working in a system that has also created that harm for young people. And so later on, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, and uh, discuss how you can better position yourself to do participatory action research and evaluation um, with young people. Now I'm gonna transition it back to Alex. Thank you. Thanks, Tiffany. Um, I really appreciate that framing of critical consciousness because one of the things about participatory action research um, that we've experienced is both the individual transformation as well as our understanding about how we can be part of transforming systems and services to better serve those that they were intended to support. Um, so really quickly, because um, we could talk forever about our work that we want to kind of position ourselves and situate ourselves um, in why are we the ones talking to you about this work. Um, 
Tiffany and I have worked together um, since 2014. I can't believe it's been eight years. Is that, is that right, Math? Yeah, eight years this month um, that we've been working together with a participatory action research team called Advocates for Richmond Youth. Um, Advocates for Richmond Youth was originally developed around uh, looking at understanding, researching, and taking action on the issue of youth homelessness, um, which I'm sure you all are very familiar is um, intricately kind of connected to um, child welfare and foster care in particular. And um, so our work has really been about um, ongoing, I think we've done about six different studies now that have branched into a number of different actions and um, efforts where we have uh, worked to end youth homelessness in our community, in our state, and even at the national level. Um, myself, the way that I came to this work, I started doing participatory action research um, in my PhD program uh, many, many years ago, almost 10 years ago, um, and was working with LGBTQ young people doing participatory action research in Phoenix, Arizona. When I moved to Richmond, Virginia, I started kind of asking around about where LGBTQ young people were in this community. That's who I wanted to work with and be led by. And um, I soon found that there was this kind of burgeoning conversation about homelessness um, and some people talking about youth homelessness, but no young people talking about youth homelessness. Um, so I was asked to support the kind of development of a team of young people and decided to use this approach that I had seen be so effective in my previous work. Um, I will say it's important for me to acknowledge that I came to that place and I built um, the team from the beginning as a white cisgender woman um, who is situated in academia in a university setting in a school of social work. Um, so I had this affiliation with a university, which both has, you know, complicated relationships with the community and with young people in this community. Um, I'm also queer and middle class and able bodied. And so all those identities really shaped also how I showed up in the team um, and how I showed up in this work. And my role has been complicated, which we'll talk more about as we go along. Um, originally, I was um, kind of identified as the facilitator and the person to bring the team together and build the team and um, support the team in learning research methods and research design. Um, but my role has definitely shifted and changed uh, over the time that we've been working together. And I'll turn it back to Tiff to talk about her um, positionality. So coming into PAR, um, my role was, I was actually on the brink of experiencing housing instability, AKA homelessness um, with my son and myself after transitioning out of um, uh, the child welfare system. And um, in that uh, transition, uh, actually one, my therapist actually connected me to this work. Um, she was like, hey, this is something that I think would be helpful for you um, because she already knew um, what was about to happen for me and my child. And she wanted to help um, in a way that was more appropriate, um, acknowledging her engagement and role in the system, but then also acknowledging the need and support that um, me and my child needed. So once she connected us, the rest of that was really history. But um, in coming into the work, um, I do acknowledge my identity as being a Black um, immigrant, uh, teen or young adult parent um, at the time um, who had child welfare experience. So there were several layers of um, trauma and um, lived expertise that um, myself and even my son had experienced prior to stepping into that space. Um, and so uh, I, I will say that um, some of Alex's role or identity did, um, did impact the way that we were able to engage. Um, I do feel like there was um, a level of trust that did have to be built, but there was also this other level of trust that was already there because of her identity. 
Um, so there were le both levels of trust and mistrust and consistent reassurance that Alex had to provide for me to be able to feel confident and comfortable stepping into that space um, of doing um, participatory action research. But what I really love about that, um, bringing that up, is that most people think that when young people are experiencing crises, that they're not able to engage in change work, but um, that this uh, completely bucked against the narrative that is, you know, placed out there around how and when to engage young people. I will say this space not only served as a, um, as an opportunity for me to engage um, in community work, but it also served as a permanent connection for myself and my child. Um, and that those relationships transformed over time. Um, and I think that's all I want to share about that. Alex, did you want to step in? Thank you, Tiffany. You actually read my mind. Um, I was just thinking about that, that um, point about what we believe about what people need to have in place before they can engage in change work. So thank you for giving voice to that. All right, so what we wanna say is that this work, participatory action research, we're not gonna get into like how to do that work. What we're gonna do is pull out some key pieces, um, lessons that we've learned about the process of participatory action research. As I said earlier, that could be applied to any research and evaluation process that you're doing with folks with lived experience. This is not cookie cutter work, um, and that's something, a big lesson that we've learned. Uh, this is really about engaging in principles and drawing on the strengths and gems within the young people or whatever population, families, whatever population you're um, engaging on your research team to create the spaces that work for them. There's no recipe book. There's no step-by-step -step process. We've looked for it, trust us, and we've been asked to, to write it and give it, and there is none. Um, but what we have learned, that the, but what we have learned is that there are some key elements to incorporate in the research and evaluation process, including relationships, barrier reduction, healing-centered focus, and attention to power. And we're going to give just a really kind of brief overview of each of those um, in the limited time that we have with you today. Over to you, Tiffany. Thank you um, for that nice uh, overview, Alex. Um, so as Alex mentioned, um, relationships are a key component of participatory action research. Um, and uh, the power of relationship in research and evaluation. Um, so uh, one of the things that uh, we wanted to lift up is that it takes intentionality to build those relationships. So just because we coexist in a space together and do the work together, does that does not mean that relationship building automatically just happens and there isn't a level of facilitation or planned engagement that needs to occur to be able to help to build that foundation. Um, so, for example, um, there has to be space built in for more informal um, engagement um, for the people who are participating and even the people who are leading and facilitating that space um, to uh, facilitating that space must have. Um, and then also, we also must see people, we must see each other as people first so that it's not a space that's just centered around the work, but it's also a space that encapsulates who we are as people um, together, which is why when Alex mentioned it's not cookie cutter work, you can't just put together a one, two, three step on how to do it is because it's really going to depend on the people that you have in that space. Um, the next piece is that trust is also an essential piece of um, cultivating those relationships, cultivating that space. Um, and that also has to be actively fostered um, in an ongoing way. So uh, an example I like to give is you don't just reach trust and that's it, we've accomplished it. It's an ongoing thing and you're gonna actively, there's gonna be times that there's gonna be missteps and you're gonna have to go backwards and reestablish you know, certain levels of trust, 
but that's natural in the nature of engaging with humans, period. Um, but I do feel like it's at an even more higher level and cost when you're working with individuals with high levels or um, multiple experiences of um, trauma. Um, and so uh, some examples of how, um, how we were able to help foster trust and build on those relationships one is just celebrating the accomplishments that you all achieved together, both together and separately, um, big and small. You know, it could be little things like a birthday or a thing like I graduated or a thing like I started therapy. Like <laughs> it can be something, you know what I'm saying? It doesn't have to be things that are completely centered around the work because that is how you make um, the space more humanistic and make people connect with each other more. We also incorporated activities that encapsulated each um, of our identities and interests. So for example, we had a lot of team members who really liked and appreciated music, art, and sensory activities. So we included things like, and, and these seem so minor, but trust me, they make the difference. But we included things like Play-Doh, scented markers, aromatherapy, music playlists, where we had a member who was known to be the DJ for our team. So whenever we had dance moments or just like moments where, uh, again, where there was informal um, spaces being built for relationships, um, where they would just put put their DJ playlist on and we could have special call outs. And there's other ways that you can engage um, people's um, identities in that work or in this space so that it becomes um, more of a, a space that's catered to the team. Um, and then also easier to foster trust and um, build on that relationship. Um, Alex, is there anything else that you wanted to add? No, that was fantastic. If it's okay, I'm going to jump into barrier reduction. Okay. So that is our second element, um, is reducing barriers that, um, in our case, young people might have to being able to participate. The first thing um, that maybe, again, is obvious, but you have to know what those barriers are. So you've got to be able to ask from the beginning um, you might be able to anticipate some barriers, but um, it's really important to begin the relationship and the engagement um, by asking people what they need to be able to show up fully and participate. Um, and again, this, these lessons can be applied to any form of engagement. A couple that we've learned um, and that we try to um, make sure that we maintain consistently, one is payment. Um, we feel like in our society, we, um, we pay for what we value, we pay for what we prioritize. And so young people feel valued and prioritized when they are compensated for their labor and for their expertise. Um, and this is also a demonstration of a belief in their expertise as young people when they're coming to the table um, as researchers. Another form of barrier reduction is just consistency. Um, one of the things that we learned early on and for many, many years, we met every single week, the same time, same place, same food, much to some of the team members chagrin, <laughs> um, but it was consistent, it was reliable, people um, found it easy to remember, to plan for, and to build into their lives. Um, a couple of other things we've learned about barrier reduction are that we really need to acknowledge that young people have competing priorities um, and, you know, really all people do. So how are we making this something that they see as one of those, those higher priorities? Because we all have a lot of things to choose from um, when we're making choices about what we get involved with. And then again, just identifying other barriers, potential barriers like transportation, like language access, um, childcare. We believe strongly in feeding people um, and really seeing the work as an investment in people and each other as much as it is about that final product, as Tiffany said. Um, we also feel like one of our mottos is once an advocate, always an advocate. 
And that for us has also been a barrier reduction because young people on our team know that if they need to step away to take care of their lives, they always have a place at the table and can come back when they're ready. Um, and so that's a really important part of our um, barrier reduction lessons. I'm gonna turn it back to you, Tiffany. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate that last point because what it really speaks to is how do you create a culture for young people to engage, for people with lived expertise to engage? Um, and so I just want that to stay at the forefront of your mind as you're thinking of, as you're listening to the remainder of the presentation. Now we'll move into three of the many considerations for cultivating a healing centered space. First, acknowledging everyone in the space experienced trauma and everyone has a role in interacting in a healing centered way. This will also require that not only a healing center space be cultivated, but knowledge base be to be built and practice around trauma informed care to be implemented. Next is that boundaries must be set. When we allow others to exercise their boundaries, it gave space and permission for us to establish our own. And this will also be very important um, as you continue to work in um, a space with people who've experienced high levels or varying um, experiences of trauma. Lastly, giving room for people to own and share their experience and not punishing people in this space for, for speaking their truth. Acknowledging that our intersectional identities may make that a similar situation result in different outcomes and that it's okay for our experience to completely go against the experience of someone else. Um, and just acknowledging that and being aware of that and embracing those differences um, in the space. Now I'm going to pass it over to Alex um, to talk about some of the benefits to researchers. Thanks, Tiffany. I think I just wanted to add, um, going back to your conversation earlier about critical consciousness that and trust, I'll bring those two things together, that similar to those things, healing-centered space also has to be ongoing and like iterative. We use the like action research spiral um, because as people become more critically conscious, um, they become more aware of the way that systems maybe have harmed them, their families, their ancestors, etc. And that can be really overwhelming. And so a healing space can be is important in that time. And that process can be really healing because many people, um, many of us have internalized or believe that we were at fault for the ways that, that we were treated or for our own harm or experiences. So just thinking about all those pieces together, I wanted to pull all of those together and to, to say that it can be an incredibly healing process for an individual as they engage in participatory action research and become more critically conscious. Um, I'll also add, and we'll share this resource out that Dr. Sean Jinright has done a lot of work around healing centered engagement. Um, we were doing it before we had language for it. And now we have this beautiful language that Dr. Jinright is um, sharing from his own work with young people. So we encourage you all to check that out if you haven't already. And then the last component or element that we want to talk about is power shifting. Um, and this is really essential to participatory action research and to any form of engagement of folks with lived experience expertise. Um, we want to say that first, it's really, really important, as Tiffany has already um, mentioned and alluded to, that in this work and anytime you're engaging people with lived experience, you need to acknowledge let's take child welfare for, for an example, right? That systems like child welfare actually limit and restrict people's um, power or their access to choices and control over certain decisions, particularly for children and young people. 
Um, and so this process of power shifting is really important, but it also can be really hard, right? Because you don't want to give someone all the power when they have had their power restricted for a really long time, because that'll be overwhelming and not actually empowering. <laughs> um, but you do want to do it in a, in a process. So you want to be really thoughtful and intentional about that process of power shifting. Um, it's also really important to acknowledge and openly discuss power dynamics in order to engage in power shifting as a team. It doesn't actually shift power. For example, on our team, if I'm the only one thinking about the power dynamics and I'm the only one taking action to try to shift a power, it really is power shifting when I say, all right, y'all, let's talk about the way this community partner keeps referring to us as Alex's team why do we think that is? Hmm, maybe because I'm white, maybe because I'm a professor, maybe because I'm part of this institution. How do we want to shift that narrative? How do we want to shift the power so that folks know y'all are the ones doing the work, we're doing it together, um, and that we're sharing power in this way? Um, so that stuff is really important. And it goes back to that individual work of I have to constantly assess and reassess my positionality, my role, my power, how that plays out, and then have those conversations with the team who are also individually assessing their role, their power, their positionality. Um, and in terms of power shifting, we also just wanna highlight that this connected to the element of relationships, that relationships and long-term investment in each other and each other relationships with each other um, make these conversations about power shifting and power both harder and easier. The deeper you're in relationship, the more issues related to power and how it plays out come up. So it happens, has to happen more frequently. Um, so that makes it a little bit both um, harder, but also a little bit easier because you begin to trust in each other's commitment to the work and to each other. And so having hard conversations becomes a little bit easier and you become more practiced at it. Um, but that doesn't make it easy. Easier doesn't equal easy. I'm going to turn it back to you, Tiffany, before we wrap up. Thank you, Alex. Okay. So next is engaging young people to change a system um, that they are reliant on for care. Um, you must recognize um, those risks and also name and acknowledge um, and actively work to mitigate those risks. Um, and this also should happen alongside and with young people, um, not assuming the role of an adult in that um, dynamic um, and deciding that I'm going to choose what's best, but uh, better yet, engaging young people and identifying um, risks and um, challenges that they may name as well. Um, so an example of this would be finding ways to have choice and control over how team members' um, experiences are incorporated into the research work, um, and not just assuming that a young person is going to, not just voluntelling a young person to share their story or um, to engage in certain work because you know they have experience of it, given choice and autonomy and how they engage in, in the research is very critical um, to authentic engagement um, for participants. Um, and then also we've seen this on a spectrum over time. So the next thing is the levels of leadership over time also create space for team members to step into their leadership and develop. I know when I first started, um, again, I was more like a participant, you know, um, I knew some connections to bigger picture things, but I wasn't all the way there. You know, there were certain things that I did not um, recognize that there were bigger issues too. For instance, my housing instability, not being able to tie that to there is a bigger system where people are experiencing homelessness on a high level, that there is a huge impact on individuals who have lived expertise of the child welfare system. And I did not understand that connection in, until I was able to get into the work. But the more that I was able to build or understand those connections, the more that I was able to feel confident serving in leadership roles. Um, well, 
I wouldn't even say leadership because I never really, you know, engaging with the team. I just felt like we worked alongside each other. Um, so I didn't really see myself as a leader in this space. And oftentimes Alex would have to remind me, hey, Tiff, like people see you as a leader in this space. Um, and so I think constant reassurance of that was also another reminders and reassurance of the role that I actually played um, in the team was also something um, as a part of building, you know, my power, helping empower me to step into the work. So now um, in the space that I'm in, um, being that I serve in more of a leadership role, um, for me, it's also acknowledging the shift in that power. Now, how do we cultivate space for other young people to step into their leadership and feel empowered to do the work and have um, autonomy and dictate direction of how they engage and share their story? Thank you everyone for listening to our session. We hope that we were able to get you all thinking about how to meaningfully engage with youth and young adults in research and evaluation with the understanding that these concepts can be used outside of the research and evaluation space. We have provided a list of resources for you to download and use in your work. Thank you again. As you have seen, engaging folks with lived experience has great value, both in thinking about changing policy and practice, but also thinking about transforming systems. Uh, research is one way to engage people with lived experience, um, but we shouldn't limit ourselves to just that uh, contribution. Uh, every public agency, every child welfare system is implementing family first. Each of those activities can benefit from engaging people with lived experience to inform the policies and practices that will ultimately be implemented for transforming the front end of the child welfare system. Through our work, we've come to believe in a set of a couple of principles here when engaging people with lived experience. One, push simply beyond asking them for their input and set a real commitment to or a goal of co-ownership. Embrace collaboration and share the power that you have with them so that they can make a full contribution. Be purposeful in the planning activities themselves so you're positioning them to make the greatest contribution. Invest in relationships with them so that they're not feeling as if you're simply there to collect their information and then to take it away from them, but you're really there to engage and understand their experience and give them an opportunity to shape your thinking, your approach, ultimately uh, to drive the decisions that you make around policies and practices. It's absolutely critical that we see people with lived experience as the experts that they are, as the knowledge keepers that they are, uh, and as the system assets that they are, that these are important contributions that these folks can make to making your system better. And we hope that you'll take the opportunity to engage them um, as often and as frequently as possible. Thanks. Thank you very much. I really appreciate our speakers, and I appreciate our participants being here today. Make sure that you check out the resources, and we will see you in the next session. Mm -hmm.